and welcome to this second first look exploring session looking at a woman killed with kindness TBA uh, by Thomas Hayward uh, we are halfway through the play uh, we found a lot to discuss last time um, and uh, a lot is going to ride on how this play ends as to how uh, how uh, uh, the, the the room takes it all um, as uh, there's there, there there were issues uh, already arising uh, which may or may not be resolved in a satisfactorily manner um, but uh, hopefully because it's looking quite tragic uh, that uh, the, the, there will be lots of deaths and everyone will be happy with those deaths at the end that's always the hope for tragedy uh, is the right people will die but then again Maybe not. We shall see. Uh, so uh, we're, as I say, going from uh, in the version that we've looked at, which is going uh, in, has an act division rather than just going with scene numbers. Uh, this is Act Three, Scene Three. Otherwise, just running Scene Nine, I think, something like that. Uh, anyway, reading today, uh, uh, Molby, Jenkin, and Keeper is Sarah Blake, actor, writer, and director, based in Germany. Reading Susan and Cranwell is... Hi, my name's Elizabeth Amisu and I'm an author based in the southeast of England. Uh, reading uh, Rodda and Frankfurt is... Hi, I'm Eric. I was about to reach for something and now I can't remember what I was about to reach for aside <laughs> from an excuse. Hi. Uh, reading Francis and Cicely today is... Brian Sparrow, actor in Lincolnshire. Uh, reading Wendell and Charles today is... Kyle DiRoberto, academic in Tucson. Uh, reading Tidy and Anne is... Uh, Lois Potter, retired academic in London. Uh, reading Sandy and Nicholas is... Hi, I'm Lynn. I'm, I'm kind of a failed academic. I'm in the northwestern <laughs> United States. And reading Mountford and Serving Man is... Alan, still in stuff. <laughs> and uh, Minister Without Portfolio today is... Alexandra, I'm here for the sea battle at the end. Don't tell me there is a one. <laughs> Don't tell me. OK, and I'm your host, Robert Crichton, who's now slightly worriedly looking ahead going, oh, <laughs> is this the redux version i don't know uh anyway um without further ado we're going to read on because we've got a lot of text to get through today act three scene three enter sir charles sister susan old montford sandy rodder and tidy you say my nephew is in great distress who brought it to him but his own lewd life i cannot spare a cross i must confess he was my brother's son, my niece. What then? This is no world in which to pity men. I was not born a beggar, though his extremes enforced this language from me. I protest no fortune of mine own could lead my tongue to this base key. I do beseech you, uncle, for the name's sake, for Christianity, nay, for God's sake, to pity his distress. He is denied the freedom of the prison, and in the hole is laid with men condemned. Plenty he hath of nothing but of irons, and it remains in you to free him thence. Money I cannot spare. Men should take heed. He lost my kindred when he fell to need. Exit Mumford. Gold is but earth, thou, thou earth enough, though earth enough shalt have. When thou hast once took measure of thy grave, you know me, Master Sandy, and my suit. I knew you, lady, when the old man lived. I knew you ere your brother sold his land. Then you were Mistress Sue, tricked up in jewels. Then you sung well, played sweetly on the lute. But now I neither know you nor your suit. You, Master Roger, was my father's tenant. When free he placed you in that wealthy farm of which you are possessed. True, he did. And have I not there dwelt still for his sake? I have some business now, but without doubt they that hurled him in will help him out. Exit Rodder following Sandy. Cold comfort still. What say you, cousin Tidy? I say this comes of roistering, swaggering. Call me not cousin. Each man for himself. Some men are born to mirth and some to sorrow. I am no cousin unto them that borrow. Exit, tidy. Oh, charity, why art thou fled 
to heaven and left all things upon this earth uneven. Their scoffing answers I will ne'er return, but to myself his grief in silence mourn. And enter Sir Francis and Mulby. She is poor, I'll therefore tempt her with this gold. Go, Mulby, in my name deliver it, and I will stay thy answer. <clears throat> Fair mistress, as I understand your grief doth grow from want, so I have here in store a means to furnish you, a bag of gold, which to your hands I freely tender you. I thank you, heavens! I thank you, gentle sir. God make me able to requite this favour. This gold Sir Francis Acton sends by me, and praise you... Acton? Oh, God! That name I'm born to curse. Hence bored, hence broker. See, I spurn his gold. My honour never shall for gain be sold. Stay, lady, stay. From you I'll posting high, even as the doves from feathered eagles fly. Exit Susan. She hates my name, my face. How should I woo? I am disgraced in everything I do. The more she hates me and disdains my love, the more I am wrapped in admiration of her divine and chaste perfections. Woo her with gifts I cannot, for all gifts sent in my name she spurns. With looks I cannot, for she abhors my sight, nor yet with letters, for none she will receive. How then? How then? Well, I will fasten such a kindness on her as shall overcome her hate and conquer it. Sir Charles, her brother, lies in execution for a great sum of money. And besides, the appeal is sued still for my huntsman's death, which only I have power to reverse. In her I'll bury all my hate of him. Go seek the keeper, Mulby, bring him to me. To save his body, I his debts will pay. To save his life, I his appeal will stay. And exit. So we have a kindness referenced uh, in relation to a woman. So um, uh, that 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 we we may finally have had a, a hint as to where the title's going uh, with what's going on here, um, which suggests also with the other elements of the title that this plan isn't going to go well. Um, but I, I don't know. I don't know where it's going to go. Um, we've had this kind of scene before um, in plays where someone who's in a desperate situation goes to all their old friends and the old friends all uh, say, nah, you're going down in the world. I don't want to be associated with you. Bye. And so, yes, hence we get these uh, people who we know so well, Sandy, Rodder and Tidy. Um, so, yeah, who all uh, leg it. Um, so yes, that's a theme we've got going back all the way to morality plays, um, and, and appears all sorts of uh, places along the way. Thoughts in the room, Bryony? I'm not sure how pertinent this is, but there was a line about her being tricked out in jewels that just really made me think of Pimp My Ride. It just struck <laughs> very strangely. Something about just that, that turn of phrase, tricked out in jewels. Liked it. Mm, cool. Um, uh, other thoughts? Uh, uh, Alexandra. Two brief thoughts. Sand, rudder and tide um, all kind of connect in some sort of linguistic way. So, so I think there's a suggestion there in their names as to their nature. Um, and uh, the other thought is uh, similar to Bryony. I, I noticed a specific line. In the mention of kindness is, I will fasten such a kindness on her, <laughs> which, you know, doesn't sound terrifying in a modern uh, uh, context at all. Makes you think of, of um, nice guys and all that. Yeah. Mm, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 Kyle, were you uh, waving there? Yeah, I was just thinking the, similarly to Alexandra, the that kindness is going to be a kind of violence uh, and which is linked to the title. So there's some linguistic fun being had in all kinds of ways, it seems mm. like. Yeah, uh, Lynn. Yeah, it's, I think, telling that his first instinct is simply to bribe her, is mm. to simply pay her for what he wants, rather than, you know, try to persuade her that, okay, I'm, a, I'm actually a very charitable person, I'm a good person, 
uh, I'm, you know, your brother was my enemy, but I'm going to to bury the hatchet because of my feelings for you, uh, you, know, you know, to go about it in a kind of more positive way. It doesn't occur to him that mm. he, he wants to use bribery and, co you know, and, and sort of coercive means rather than than genuine kindness that's his first instinct so i think that's i think that's telling about his yeah. character i mean she's never reacted well to him i mean the previous time yeah. she saw him she immediately just went oh god not you and ran away immediately <laughs> uh, and here pretty much exactly the same um i mean yeah it's a, quite an opening gambit she is poor i'll therefore tempt her with this gold um i mean that's quite a that's quite a line uh sarah i i know it's a it's a trope that that crops up in a lot of plays, but it the, the whole tricked out with Jules thing, in in um, combination with with all the, the the different people shunning her, did really make me think of Jane Shaw. Mm -hmm. And I and I'm just wondering if there's going to be any parallel there. I don't know, mm -hmm. but it just it she, she did really. Uh, it seemed like a um, quite a. a, a for the for the original audience, I'm thinking quite an obvious parallel, maybe. Not unreasonably. I mean, we've got one Jane Shaw, which is only a few years earlier than this, and the other one, okay, is about the better part of a decade. But um, you know, they're both uh, they're both out and about somewhere, if in print, if nowhere else. Uh, Lois, then Eric, and then we will move on. Yeah, I mean, Haywood likes these sharp contrasts of you know fabulous wealth and fabulous poverty, mm. but uh, it's it's in a way the opposite of Jane Shore. I mean, Jane Shore was wealthy. Uh, well, she was wealthy when she was with her husband, but she was even wealthier when she was the king's mistress. And then after that, she was poor. Uh, this is uh, you know the the opposite kind of thing. She uh, she was wealthy uh, back in the days before her brother got into all this trouble, and she would be. Uh, and they're kind of gloating over the fact that uh, she isn't that wealthy now. I mean, there was an interesting point made earlier about that bit of property they had. I think you had to have you had to be a possessor of land to be a gentleman. Mm -hmm. And that's absolutely crucial for both Charles and Susan. And she also talks to uh, her uncle about uh, for the sake of their name. He, you know, would he do something to help her? I mean, it's all part of that sense of the family's honor, really. Mm. Uh, Eric. I was just going to say maybe this is a Susan from, um, what do you call it? Um, it was the neighbor that we never get to meet in an, uh, <laughs> an Englishman for my money, because uh, we never actually get to meet her, though she's the excuse for everything. Um, like, yeah, I'm going to go stay with Susan, which is a totally not real person. Um, but also just, I don't know, Susan is such a, well, not a generic name, but it just seems like a very common name. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. As opposed to something fancier, or, I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's just an interesting uh, sort of uh, asking around kind of thing. Mm. Okay, uh, we're going to go on to Act 4, Scene 1. Enter Sir Charles Montford in prison with irons, his feet bare, his garments all ragged and torn. Oh, fall on earth's face most miserable. Breathe in this hellish dungeon thy laments. Thus like a slave ragged, like a felon gived, that hurls thee headlong to this base estate. O oh, unkind uncle, O oh, my friends in great, unthankful kinsmen, Montsford's all too base, to let thy name be fettered in disgrace. A thousand deaths here in this grave I die. Fear, hunger, sorrow, cold, all threat my death, and join together to deprive my breath, and that which most torments me, my dear sister hath left to visit me, and from my friends hath brought no hopeful answer. Therefore, I divine they will not help my misery. If it be so, shame, scandal, and contempt attend their covetous thoughts. Need make their graves. Users they live, and may they die like slaves. Enter Keeper. Night, be of comfort, for I bring thee freedom from all thy troubles. Then I am doomed to die. Death is the end of all calamity. Live, your appeal is stayed. The execution of all your debts discharged, your creditors even to the utmost penny satisfied. In sign whereof your shackles I knock off. You are not left so much indebted to us as for your fees, all is discharged, all paid. Go freely to your house or where you please. After long miseries, embrace your ease. Thou grumblest out the sweetest music to me, 
that ever organ played? Is this a dream? Or do my waking senses apprehend the pleasing taste of these applausive news? Slave that I was to wrong such honest friends, my loving kinsmen and my near allies, tongue I will bite thee for the scandal breathed against such faithful kinsmen. They are all composed of pity and compassion, of melting charity and of moving ruth. That which I spoke before was in my rage. They are my friends, the mirrors of the sage, bounteous and free, the noble Montfort's race, ne'er bred a covetous thought or humor base. Enter Susan. I cannot longer stay from visiting my woeful brother. While I could, I kept my hapless tidings from his hopeful ear. Sister, how much I am indebted to thee and to thy travail. What? At liberty? Thou seest I am, thanks to thy industry. Oh, unto which of all my friends am I thus bound? My uncle Montford, he even of an infant loved me. Was it he? So did my cousin, Tidy. Was it he? So Master Roder, Master Sandy too, which of all these did his, this high kindness do? Charles, can you mock me in your poverty, knowing your friends deride your misery? Now, I protest I stand so much amazed to see your bonds free and your irons knocked off, that I am wrapped in, into a maze of wonder. The rather for I know not by what means this happiness hath chanced. Why, by my uncle, my cousins, and my friends, who else, I pray, would take upon them all my debts to pay? Oh, brother, they are men made of all of flint, pictures of marble and as void of pity as chaste bears. I begged, I sued, I kneeled, laid open all your griefs and miseries, which they derided, but more than that, denied us a part in their alliance. But in pride, said that our kindred with our plenty died. Drudges too much? What did they? Oh, known evil, rich fly the poor, as good men shun the devil. Whence should my freedom come? Of whom, alive, saving of those, have I deserved so well? Guess, sister, call to mind, remember me. These have I raised, thy fellow the world's guise, whom rich they honor, they in woe despise. My wits have lost themselves, Let's ask the keeper. Goller. Uh, at hand, sir. Of courtesy, resolve me one demand. What was he took the burden of my debts from off my back, stayed my appeal to death, discharged my fees, and brought me liberty? A courteous knight, one called Sir Francis Acton. Ha, ah, Acton. Oh, me, more distressed in this than all my troubles. Hail me back, double my irons and my sparing meals, put into halves and lodge me in a dungeon, more deep, more dark, more cold, more comfortless. By act and freed, not all my manacles could fetter so my heels as this one word hath thralled my heart, and it must now lie bound in more strict prison than thy stony goal. I am not free, I go but under bail. My charge is done, sir, now I have my fees. As we get little, we will nothing lease. By act and free, my dangerous opposite. Why, to what end? On what occasion? Ha! Let me forget the name of enemy, and with indifference balance this high favour. His love to me, upon my soul, tis so. That is the root from whence these strange things grow. Had this... Had, the, had this proceeded from my father, he that by the law of nature is most bound in offices of love, it had deserved my best employment to requite that grace. Had it proceeded from my friends or him from them, this action had deserved my life, and from a stranger more, because from such there is less execution of good deeds. But he, nor father, nor ally, nor friend, more than a stranger, both remote in blood and in his heart, opposed my enemy, that this high bounty should proceed from him. Oh, there I lose myself. What should I say? What think? What do? His bounty to repay. You wonder, I am sure, whence this strange kindness proceeds in Acton. I will tell you, brother, he dotes on me, and oft hath sent me gifts, letters, and tokens. I refuse them all. I have enough. Though poor, my heart is set in one rich gift to pay back all my debt. And... 
exit with a closing line that's slightly worrying. Um, yeah. Lightly? I, I mean, it, it <laughs> might be a bit ambiguous. <laughs> it might not be. I Maybe. Yeah, probably not there. Um, yes, yeah, Susan does seem to be a sh considerably sharper uh, knife in the drawer than Charles is. Uh, Charles is really slow on the upkeep of everything, and he always leaps to the worst uh, impression of anything. It's always, oh God, I'm dead. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, there's, 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 there's something, you know, because uh, there's something a bit extra about him at times. Uh, whereas Susan does seem to be just, yeah, a lot more grounded. Uh, Lynn. Yeah, that that last line really is like it's super troubling. I have enough. You don't have anything. It's not yours. <laughs> I, I mean, even like legally speaking, if her father is dead, she actually might be her uncle's ward rather than her brother's. So, I... ew. Hmm. Uh, Lois, I think I have enough just means I know enough, doesn't it? Hmm. Hmm. Um. Uh, Elizabeth. Yeah, I just found it really interesting. The last two scenes, we have this like rever like reversals of fortune, kind of like uh, it was all going terribly and now it's going to be fine. And oh no, it's this person who saved us. And I just thought that it's continuing the track that the play was on yesterday, uh, last session, where it kind of has these left turns and it's like unexpected, um, an unexpected series of events. Mm. which I think are building to something. Mm. You know, we were talking about whether Susan or Anne is that woman killed with kindness. And um, <laughs> my money's on Susan. Mm. Uh, it's 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 it, yeah you're absolutely right especially charles's story which is constantly pivoting from i killed someone i'm going to go to prison i'm going to die oh i'm free uh oh no, we're fine we'll be fun farmers oh no they've taken my house i'm going to prison again i'm going to die and then no, no it's fine oh oh but no and back and forth and back and forth um yeah it's it's really just just tied in tied out isn't it uh mm -hmm. any other thoughts before we move on to our next scene <coughs> Uh, Sarah, then Alexandra. This is so clever because I was convinced yesterday that Anne was going to be the woman killed with kindness. I don't know why, just because her story was just like quite a bit desperate. And also we started with her with her wedding and everything. I just assumed it was going to be her. And now it's like, oh, is it going to be Susan? It's it's quite it's quite clever. Mm. Well, we shall see. Uh, no spoilers for anyone who knows where this is going. Alexandra. Uh, I just wanted to point out something that we've been discussing in the chat, which is that it's it seems to be an interesting contrast, the way that uh, Charles, as you said, kind of goes into the extreme uh, and, he, and he, he sort of thinks of the worst possible consequences from ambiguous information, whereas Frankfurt didn't do that. Um, when he was presented with the possibility of, of his wife cheating, which we know is true, but uh, he doesn't. Um, and I think it's intent. It, it's interesting if this is set up as a contrast and you can intentionally make it that way in how you stage it. Mm. Yeah. Um, okay. Good thoughts. I'm liking this. Act four, scene two. Enter Frankfurt and Nicholas with keys and a letter in his hand. This is the night that I must play my part. Tried two seeming angels. Where's my keys? They are made according to your mold in wax. I bade the smith be secret, gave him money, and here they are. The letter, sir. Do take it. There it is. And when thou seest me in my pleasantest vein, ready to sit to supper, bring it me. I'll do it. Make no question, but I'll do it. And exit Nicholas. Enter Mistress Anne Frankford, Cranwell, Wendell, and Jenkin. Ah, Sarah, tis six o'clock already struck. I go bid them spread the cloth and serve in supper. It shall be done, forsooth, Mistress. Uh, where's Spigot the butler to give us out salt in trenches? Spigot? Wendell, who's Wendell? Uh, Carl. I've lost my place. I, I... We have been uh, hunting all the day. The 
is it to recompense their wrongs? No, uh, we have been uh, hunting all the day, uh, Wendy. Okay. So sorry, I don't know how I lost this completely. It's in the chat. That's never happened to Carl before. <laughs> I know. Oh my God. It happens to all of us. Mm -hmm. At least once. Anyone got a page number? Yeah, do you have a page number? Mm. What is it? 75? 35. 35. So sorry. It's also in the chat. Can't see it. <laughs> Act four, scene two, a few lines down. Okay. Almost there. Sorry. We have been hunting all the day. Come with prepared stomachs, Master Frankford. We wish you at our sport. My heart was with you and my mind was on you. Fine, Master Cranwell, you are still thus sad. A stool, a stool. Where's Jenkin and where's Nick? Tis supper time at least an hour ago. What's the best news abroad? I know none good. But I know too much bad. Enter butler, uh, spigot, and Jenkin with a tablecloth, bread, trenchers, and salt, then exuant. Mr. <laughs> You might have that interest in your wife's brother to be more remiss in his hard dealing against poor Sir Charles, who, as I hear, lies in York Castle, needy and in great want. If not more weighty business of mine own hold me away, I would have laboured peace betwixt them with all care. Indeed I would, sir. I'll write unto my brother earnestly on that behalf. A charitable deed, and well beget the good opinion of all friends that love you, Mistress Frankford. That's for you, for one. I know you love Sir Charles and my wife too as well. He deserves the love of all true gentlemen. Be yourself, judge. But supper, ho, now as thou lovest me, Wendell, which I'm sure thou dost. Be merry, pleasant, and frolic it tonight. Uh, sweet Master Cranwell, do you like? Wife, I protest, my heart was ne'er more bent on sweet alacrity. Where be those lazy knaves to serve in supper? Uh, enter Nicholas. Here's a letter, sir. Uh, whence comes it, and who brought it? A stripling that below attends your answer, and he tells me it is sent from York. Have him into the cellar. Let him taste a cup of our March beer. Go, make him drink. I'll make him drunk if he be a Trojan. My boots and spurs. Where's Jenkins? God, forgive me how I neglect my business. Wife, look here, I have a matter to be tried tomorrow by eight o'clock, and my attorney writes me. I must be there betimes with evidence, or else it will go against me. Where's my boots? Yeah, enter Jenkin with boots and spurs. Uh, I hope your business craves no such dispatch, that you must ride tonight. I hope it does. Gods me, no such dispatch. Jenkin, my boots, where's Nick? Sat on my roan and the grey dapple for himself. Content ye, much concerns me. Uh, gentle Master Cranwell and Master Wendell, in my absence, use the very ripest pleasure of my house. Lord Master Frankfurt, will you ride tonight? The ways are dangerous. Therefore will I ride, pointed well in social Nick, my man. I'll call you up at, by five o'clock tomorrow. No, by my faith, wife, I'll not trust to that. Tis not such easy rising in the morning from one I love so dearly. No, by my faith, I shall not leave so sweet a bed, Philip, but with much pain. You have made me a sluggard since I first knew you. Then, if you needs will go this dangerous evening, uh, Master Wendell, let me entreat you, bear him company. With all my heart, sweet mistress, my boots, there. Fie, fie, that for my private business I should disease a friend and be in trouble to the whole house. Nick! Anon, sir! Bring forth my gilding. As you love me, sir, use no more words. A hand, good master Cranwell. Sir, God be your good speed. Good night, sweet Nan. Nay, nay, a kiss and part. Dissembling lips, you suit not with my heart. Exuant Frankfurt and Nicholas. How business, time, and hours all gracious prove, and are the furtherers to my newborn love. 
I am husband now in Master Frankfurt's place and must command the house. My pleasure is we will not sup abroad so publicly, but in our private chamber, Master Frank, Mistress Frankfurt. Sir, you are too public in your love. And Master Frankfurt's wife, might I crave favor? I would entreat you I might see my chamber. I am on the sudden grown exceeding ill and would be spared from supper. Light there, ho, see you want nothing, sir, for if you do, you injure the, that good man and wrong me too. I will make bold. Good night. And exit Cranwell. How all conspire to make our bosom sweet and full entire. Come, Nan, I pray thee, let us sup within. Oh, what a clog unto the soul is sin. We pale offenders are still full of fear. Every suspicious eye brings danger near. When they whose clear hearts from offense are free, despise report, base scandals do outface, and stand at mere defiance with disgrace. Fie, fie, you talk to like a Puritan. You have tempted me to mischief, Master Wendell. I have done I know not what. Well, you plead custom. That which for want of wit I granted erst, I now must yield through fear. Come, come, let's in. Once over shoes, we are straight or head in sin. My jack jocund soul is joyful beyond measure. I'll be profuse in Frankfurt's richest treasure. And they exit. Uh, okay. Um more uh more stuff going on there i'm i'm interested i'm curious about cranwell i'm curious is, is cranwell actually feeling a bit ill and wanting to go to bed or is he just going i don't want to be here for any of this i think i'm just <laughs> gonna get, politely find a way to leave as quickly as possible uh alan then elizabeth yeah i'm mean, cranwell's about the only one who's got any sense of reading the room mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah uh elizabeth yeah i thought it was a bit uh convenient the way cranwell was suddenly very taken ill and uh under the weather it reminded me of twilight when mike newton suddenly starts to become sick at the cinema um <laughs> yeah i i think there's a real dynamism to this scene i love the asides i think something hayward is really good at is those asides and how it kind of flips back to the main conversation and it goes back and forth i like that because mm, we know what frankfurt's planning we know you know yeah. this is all a setup um it's it's offering all sorts and it's offering all sorts of interesting information about how these relationships are functioning uh Bryony, then lynn then eric then lois yeah i just thought that, that last bit from anne was really interesting because it kind of confirms what sarah had been kind of feeling yesterday about her not being a hundred percent into all of this you know, and having some reservations and some conflicting feelings. Um, so I think it, it just kind of offers an interesting insight into her character. Mm. Yeah, it's that question of, you know, it, 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 uh, if she was in enthusiastic at the very beginning, she regrets it incredibly quickly and, you know, is regretting it more and more ever since so to the point where it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's uh, getting really quite creepy. Uh, Lynn, then Eric. Yeah, as if this scene weren't uncomfortable enough because... We know that Frankfurt knows and evidently the lovers do not know that he knows and maybe Cranwell knows what Frankfurt knows and he's in on Frankfurt's plan. But then Frankfurt has that line about, oh, I would never be able to get up in the morning because sleeping with you is so nice. Wow, that's that's really kind of creepy and, and, and uncomfortable. I mean, that's just uh, that's that's Frankfurt kind of kind of twisting the knife, isn't it? Mm. Mm. Uh, Eric, then Lois. I was just going to say that, like, OK, Frankfurt has planned this clearly, but then like also we get the first mention of the sort of overlap. I mean, we, we kind of knew the overlap because of the, the uh, of the, the B plot and the A plot because of, um, you know, the beginning of the, the wedding at the beginning, but like after that they just diverged and now they kind of just seem to be converging again 
Yeah, Cranwell turns up and goes, "Hi, do you remember that? Do you, do you, there's there's another plot happening in this play over <laughs> here, and you know what? We should really mention it because we are all sort of a bit interrelated. Um, so yeah, it's sort of a late onset plot thing, um, and, uh, being being thrown into the scene. Uh, Lois, then Alexandra, then we will move on. Yeah, it's about the right point to mention it because uh, the audience might start wondering, you know, if these people are so nice, why haven't they done anything to help uh, uh, Sir Charles, you know, and so uh, that gets taken care of quite economically. And it also shows that there's a real world out there and that Frankfurt and Anne are still relating to it in, in some way or other. But uh, I'm also just interested in the fact that Anne really does everything possible to try to keep from having another night with Wendell. I mean, uh, you know, she wants him to leave with her husband or she wants her husband to stay and get up early in the morning instead. Mm. Uh, Alexandra. Yeah, that's the point I wanted to make. It's it's interesting. It's very interesting and and rather creepy how much of an effort Anne is making to keep her husband at home or to send them both away. Um, and also when it comes to okay, that's that's he's definitely gone. Um, we're left alone, my darling. She her response is no, this is horrible. As opposed to oh well, we can do what we want now. It's it's yeah. It seems more and more to me that she's not a willing party in this arrangement or as you said if she was enthusiastic to begin with this has changed uh massively mm. oh absolutely I, yeah there, 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 there are there are some serious consent issues where, raised by what Anne says there at the end of the scene um and uh, yeah um well we never said this was going to be a comedy um so let's uh, let's see where this goes we'll run the next two scenes into each other because one's quite short uh act four scene three enter sicily uh, Jenkins, Spigot, and other serving men. My mistress and master Wendell, my master, sup in her chamber tonight. Cicely, you are preferred from being the cook to be chambermaid. Of all the loves betwixt thee and me, tell me what thou thinkst of this. Mum, there's an old proverb, when the cap's away, the mouse may play. Now you talk of a cat, Cicely, I smell a rat. Good words, Jenkin, lest you be called to answer them. Why, God make my mistress an honest woman. Are not these good words? Pray God my new master play not the knave with my old master. Is there any hurt in this? God send no villainy intended. And if they do sup together, pray God they do not lie together. God make my mistress chase and make us all his servants what harm is there in all this? Nay, more. Here in my hand thou shalt never have my heart unless thou say Amen. Amen. I pray God, I say. Enter serving man. My mistress sends that you should make less noise. So lock up the doors, see the house I'll all go to bed. You, Jenkin, this night I made the porter to see the gate shut in. Thus by little and little I creep into office. Come, to kennel, my masters, to kennel. Tis eleven o'clock already. When you have locked the gates in, you must send the key, have the keys to thy mistress. Quickly, for God's sake, Jenkin, for I must carry them. I am neither pillow nor bolster, but I know more than both. To bed, good spigot. To bed, good honest serving creatures. And let us sleep as snug as pigs in peace drawer. And they exit Act 4, Scene 4, Enter Frankfurt and Nicholas. Soft, soft, we've tied our gildings to a tree, two flight shot off, lest by their thundering hoofs they blabber coming back. Hearest thou no noise? Here, I hear nothing but the owl and you. So, now my watch's hand points upon twelve, and it is dead midnight. Where are my keys? Here, sir. This is the key that opes my outward gate this the hall door this the withdrawing chamber but this that that door that's bored unto my shame fountain and spring of all my bleeding thoughts where the most hallowed order and or and true knot of nuptial sanctity hath been profaned it leads to my polluted bedchamber once my terrestrial heaven now my earth's hell the place where sins in all their ripeness dwell but I forget myself. Now to my gate. It must open with far less noise than Cripplegate or your plot's dashed. So reach me my dark lantern to the rest. Tread softly, softly. I will walk on eggs this place. 
a general silence hath surprised the house, and this is the last door. Astonishment, fear, and amazement beat upon my heart, even as a madman beats upon a drum. Oh, keep my eyes, you heavens, before I enter from any sight that may transfix my soul, or if there be so black a spectacle, it will strike mine eyes stark blind, or if not so, lend me such patience to digest my grief that I may keep this white and virgin hand from any violent outrage or red murder. And with that prayer, I enter. Exuant into the house. Enter Nicholas. Here's a circumstance. A man may be made cuckold in the time that he's about it. And the case were mine, as tis my master's, blood that he makes me swear, I would have placed his action, entered there. I would, I would. Yeah, enter Frankfurt. Oh, oh, master, it's blood, master, master. Oh, me unhappy, I found them lying close in each other's arms and fast asleep, but that I would not damn two precious souls bought with my Saviour's blood and send them with all their scarlet sins upon their backs unto a fearful judgment. Their two lives had met upon my rapier. Master, what? Have you left them sleeping still? Let me go wake them. Stay. Let me pause a while. Oh, God. God, that it were possible to undo things done, to call back yesterday that time could turn up his swift sandy glass, to untell the days and redeem these hours, or that the sun could, rising from the west, draw his coach backward, uh, his, yeah, his coach backward, take from the account of time so many minutes till he had all these seasons gained, called again, those minutes and those actions done in them. Even from her first offence, that I might take her as spotless as an angel in my arms. But oh, I talk of things impossible and cast beyond the moon. God give me patience, for I will in and wake them. Exit Frankfurt. Here's patience perforce. He needs must trot a foot that tires his horse. Exit Nicholas. Enter Wendell, running over the stage in a nightgown. Frankfurt after him with his sword drawn. A maid in a smock stays his hand and clasps hold on him. He pauses for a while. Thank thee, maid, thou like the angel's hand has stayed me from a bloody sacrifice. Go, villain, and my wrong. Sit on thy soul as heavy as this grief doth on mine. When thou records my many courtesies and shall compare them with thy treacherous heart, lay them together, weigh them equally, it will be revenge enough. Go to thy friend, a Judas, pray, pray, lest I live to see the Judas like hanged on an elder tree. Enter Mistress Anne Frankfurt in her smock nightgown and night attire. Oh, by what word, what title, or what name shall I entreat your pardon? Pardon? Oh, I am as far from hoping such sweet grace as Lucifer from heaven. To call you husband, oh me, most wretched, I have lost that name. I am no more your wife. Blood, sir, she swoons. Spare thou thy tears, for I will weep for thee. And keep thy countenance, for I'll blush for thee. Now, I protest, I think tis I am tainted, for I am most ashamed, and tis more hard for me to look upon thy guilty face than on the sun's clear brow. What? Dost thou speak? I would I had no tongue, no ears, no eyes, no apprehension, no capacity. Uh, when do you spurn me like a dog? When tread me under feet? When drag me by the hair? Though I deserve a thousand, thousand fold more than you can inflict, yet once my husband, for womanhood, to which I am a shame, though once an ornament, even for his sake that hath redeemed our souls, mark not my face, nor hack me with your sword, but let me go perfect and undeformed to my tomb, I am not worthy that I should prevail in the least suit. No, not to speak to you, nor look on you, nor to be in your presence. Yet, as an abject, this one suit I crave. Uh, this granted, I am ready for my grave. And God with patience arm me. Rise, nay, rise, and I'll debate with thee. Was it for want thou place the strumpet? Was thou not supplied with every pleasure, fashion, and new toy, nay, even beyond my calling? 
I was. Was it then disability in me, or in thine eye seemed he a proper man? Oh, no. Did I not lodge thee in my bosom, wear thee here in my heart? You did. I did indeed witness my tears. I did. Go, bring in my bring my infants hither. Two children are brought in. Oh, Nan, oh, Nan, if neither shame, if neither fear or shame, regard of honour, the blemish of my house, nor my dear love, could have withheld thee from so lewd a fact. Yet for these infants, these young, harmless souls, on whose white brows thy shame is ca uh, characters? Thy shame is charactered and grows in greatness as they wax in years. Look but on them and melt away in tears. Away with them. Lest as her spotted body hath stained their names with stripe of bastardy, so her adulterous breath may blot Asked her their spirits with her infectious thoughts. Away with them. Exuant children. In this one life, I die ten thousand deaths. Stand up. Stand up. I will do nothing rashly. I will retire a while into my study, and thou shalt hear thy sentence presently. Exit Frankfurt. Tis welcome, be it death. Oh, me base strumpet, that having such a husband, such sweet children must enjoy neither. Oh, to redeem mine honor, I'd have this hand cut off, these my breasts seared, the rat strapadoed put to any torment, nay, to whip but this scandal out, I'd hazard the rich and dear redemption of my soul. He cannot be so base as to forgive me, nor I so shameless, to accept his pardon. O oh, women, women, you that have yet kept your holy matrimonial vow unstained, make me your instance. When you tread awry, your sins, like mine, will on your conscience lie. Enter Sicily, Spigot, all the serving men, and Jenkin as newly came out of bed. All together now. Oh, mistress, oh, mistress, 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 you done, mistress. mistress. But what a caterwauling keep you here. Oh, Lord, mistress, how comes this to pass? My master has run away in his shirt and never so much as called me to bring his clothes after him. See what guilt is. Here stand I in this place, ashamed to look my servants in the face. Enter Frankfurt and Cranwell, whom seeing she falls on her knees. My words are registered in heaven already. With patience, hear me. I'll not martyr to thee, nor mark thee for a strumpet, but with usage of more humility would torment thy soul and kill thee even with kindness. Master Frankfurt? Good Master Cromwell, woman, hear thy judgment. Go make thee ready in thy best attire. Take with thee all thy gowns, all thy apparel. Leave nothing that ever did ever call thee mistress, or by whose sight of being left here in the house I may remember such a woman by. Choose thee a bed and hangs for thy chamber. Take with thee everything which hath thy mark and get thee to my manor, seven mile off, where live. Tis thine. I freely give it thee. My tenants by my tenants by shall furnish thee with wains to carry all thy stuff within two hours. No longer will I limit thee my sight. Choose which all of my servants thou likes best, and they are thine to attend thee. A uh, mild sentence. But as thou hopest for heaven, as thou believest thy name recorded in the book of life, charge thee never after this sad day to see me or to meet me, or to send by word or writing, gift or otherwise, to move me by thyself or by thy friends, nor challenge any part of my two children. So farewell now. For we will henceforth be as we had never be seen, ne'er more shall see. How oh, full my heart is, in mine eyes appears. What wants in words I will supply in tears. Come, take your coach, all your, your stuff, all must along. Servants and all make ready. All be gone. It was thy hand cut two hearts out of one. And they exit. End of scene. So, uh, we have finally got the title. 
It, it wasn't Susan. It did turn out to be Anne. But maybe Susan will also be killed with kindness too. So let's let's. There's there's still more killing potentially, um, and uh, how <clears throat> literal or metaphorical that killing will be, we shall see. Um, so that's that's a playwright just basically going right. How can I make this situation worse? What's the worst thing? I, what's the force multiplier I can do? Let's bring on some children. Let's bring on. They don't have to have any lines. We probably can't afford children with lines. Um, but let's uh, let's just get some extras in and uh, make that situation even worse and it's it's really interesting i think this was mentioned in the chat but the just the way it builds an atmosphere from the pre the end of the previous scene um where you've got the servants going are we going to lock the house up and of course we know there's a set another set of keys um and that that nighttime atmosphere is built very methodically at the top of this scene as well um so that this question of what frankfurt's going to do because you know it's early modern play. We're we're kind of expecting he's got a, he's got a weapon. We're not expecting this to come out without bloodshed, and it doesn't actually. Um, and and yeah, the way he goes in and then comes out again and then goes back in again. Um, the, the, it's loaded with potential. We don't know. I I don't know who, who here would have bet money on on the the ending that we got from this scene. Um, and that anticipation is really nicely put in there uh thoughts in the room um kyle I, there was one thing that struck me and that was when he says you you believe your name is written in the book of life uh as, as a kind of puritan uh suggestion and then the way this is building up like you said also i feel like if it if if this is a puritan that that kind of conversion is important or that repentance uh, before you die and the good death and so oh, oh, it was just, that just seems to be kind of being set up here I know, I'm not sure if that happens or not mm. uh, other thoughts um, uh, uh, from other people other than me otherwise I'll start vamping uh, Alexandra <laughs> um, there's, there's a bunch of them but um, I, I thought I'd formulate them before I start speaking that's generally a good idea um, one of the things is I've been I've been complaining in the in the chat about the way that Anne is written in general and and before this and I think um, if we this scene is a very powerful scene for the reasons that you've pointed out and also the way in which Anne kind of interacts in this is can be really heartrending um i think this it, it's slightly undercut by the fact that for instance we've never even heard about these children no one has mentioned that she gives a damn about her children so the fact that they appear get taken off and she goes this is the worst thing that could happen to me <sighs> Um, and and I think there's there's a few um, th there were several other details that again as a modern production you would need to fill those gaps in for the audience so as to give the audience that yes this is an understanding of of uh, yes this is the worst thing that could happen to her yes she's um, you know what exactly has she been through or how exactly has her evolution as a character happened thus far in terms of all those possibilities we were talking about before so that this enormous change in this scene can be as impactful as it needs to be so the thing that we're kind of discussing in the chat is that you know a, a production essentially needs to make some decisions about Anne which I think was the conclusion we had <laughs> yesterday as well Yes, yeah. the script is giving us sort of bones, but uh, especially in Anne's case, not actually filling in a lot of flesh um, yeah. on, on, in terms of the way uh, the dialogue is actually structured and what she's actually saying um, isn't, isn't necessarily, is, is giving us an idea of things. But yeah, a lot of work needs to, to go into that. I think you're absolutely right. I suspect that Hayward didn't know that there were going to be two children until he thought, <laughs> oh, hang on, shall we just bring on some children here? That's a good force multiplier for this scene, isn't yeah. it? Yes, there we go. Yeah. On they yeah. come. Um, um, uh, Lynn, then Bryony, then Lois. Yeah, it does. It does feel a little, a little after the fact. I mean, the, the play begins with the their wedding, so we have mm. no, and there's no indicator that very much time has passed in order for her, her to have a couple of children. At least two years must have gone by. Um, so yeah, that was it, that 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 feels a little, yeah. Um, like a continuity problem um but more substantively uh, what's really interesting about what's going on in this scene is 
yeah, this is the worst thing that could happen to me, says Anne. Um, and Frank must know that when he devises this punishment. Um, because it's the worst thing that could happen to a person who is basically decent and has a conscience. But it's, if she were, if she really were a strumpet, if she was really somebody who didn't care, if she were, if she were like corrupt in her in her soul, she'd be like, I get my own place and my own service. Cool. See ya. But that's not what she. But that's not what she says. She knows she doesn't deserve this kind of of um, mercy, and it sort of tortures her. So did Frank make that choice? deliberately knowing that it would it would be torment to her mm. because she's a good person or did he be like well if she's a good person it'll be a punishment for her and if she's a bad person she'll just she'll just assure the the, the cond condemnation of her soul i think kyle's uh um comment about is there sort of a puritan uh worldview going on here uh, it might be really germane so either way, I win. She either gets tormented in this world, but her name is in the book of life. Okay. Um, or I give her a chance to sin more. She gets damned to hell. That's that. That's what I'm... Is... Mm. Mm. Yes. I mean, <laughs> is this is this a kindness? I mean, this is the thing. Is It does yeah. seem that the Fra uh, Frankfurt has really designed this to torment this particular human being mm -hmm. the, the most. Actually, you know, because in a sense, they would, they would welcome on some level some sort of more uh, heavy, heavily penitential thing. Yeah. I mean, he's still keeping the, 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 the kids. Um, uh, so, you know, it's still it, there's still a, a, a cruelty going on there on some level. Uh, Bryony, then Lois, then Sarah, then Eric, and then we must move on. Yeah, I um, we had a bit of a chat in the in the chat about Anne in this scene, and for me, I don't know. I just there were just a couple of things in this scene, and I'm not saying they couldn't be worked out by a good director and a, and a good actor, but they would need to be worked out because they just didn't seem to make sense. Like they they were just at odds with the with the character of Anne that we've been kind of building up together and discussing, and you know and what we thought about. I don't know. I just really found that when she when she was saying basically like please spare my face if you're gonna kill me just spare my face because <laughs> I, I, that, that, I just did not get that at all i don't know if mm. anyone else can uh lois yeah um there's a sort of symbolism i, th I think in this i mean in, in that uh, it's a totally anonymous servant who stops frankfurt from killing her which is his first impulse uh or actually from killing wendell i think mm. uh and then, uh, and then after that, he takes time to recover. I mean, I think uh, to make him at all sympathetic, you've got to realize there's a huge internal struggle going on, that this isn't something obviously that he's already worked out. He goes off to his study to think about it and then comes back. Uh, I mean, obviously it's a temptation uh, from my wow. point of view to play him as a sadistic bastard who is just uh, out to get her. And that was sort of what was being done, I think in a couple of the productions I saw because they were, uh, they, they just couldn't take a, the Elizabethan puritanical attitude to adultery at all, even though Anne has obviously completely internalized it. Um, something I think would be quite good and easy to do would be in that first scene where Frankfurt comes on saying how happily married he is and so on before Wendell arrives, you could easily have him and possibly with Anne playing with the children. I mean, you know, something to suggest here, we got this lovely, happy family. I mean, you could, you could just do that for about one minute and then, uh, mm. And at least people would know that time had passed and that when Wendell arrives, it's going to be a disturber of something that's been established. Ha yeah, he's handing out cigars of the, from, from mm -hmm. you know, the birth of my first children, you know, my children. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that kind of uh, sort of visual signifier. Uh, Eric, then Sarah. I, I was just going to talk about Frankfurt because his journey, I mean, okay, we've talked about them a lot, but it just, it, the whole thing of like, haven't I basically pampered you? Have, have you not been happy? That that thing actually sounds quite like earnest, um, like believable until you know, bring my infants hither was kind of weird and threw me off. And I'm like, okay, now um, but yeah, the whole um what also threw me off was the fact that he doesn't kill Wendell. He doesn't go, I'm gonna kill you now. <laughs> Although he 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 sort of um says that he's tempted to, he kind of goes. Yeah, I'm going to, you're going to get like 
pay back off the death or something um or you know you, you better pray i don't see you again or you know um sort of that kind of thing as for the 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 being uh, left undeformed i think that might also play into the religious thing of um what's it called um not necessarily vanity but um there's um at least in for example very traditional strict uh, greek orthodox things um, I know that there's um, like very conservative Greek Orthodox religion, Christian stuff. Uh, that is very technical, I know. Um, they kind of believe that, you know, being deformed in any way, sort of even, you know, getting a transplant or um, receiving or giving a transplant to someone is means that you can't be buried like in as uh, sort of um, intact. So being buried intact would have been maybe very important i'm guessing <laughs> so yeah um maybe that's why mm. uh and briefly sarah yes these children uh lois has already uh um enunciated the the idea that i had that these children could appear earlier on but um they might have been added in by hayward uh like as an afterthought but i think they actually they're really effective in, in what they do to this plot because um, to go back to what Lynn was saying, uh, you know, is, is she gonna enjoy, uh, is she gonna be a strumpet and enjoy the, uh, you, know, you know, the manor house and the servants or is she going to, you know, suffer and therefore that will kind of to an extent prove her innocence. I think it's possible to be um, a not very um, moral person and still, um, you know, be absolutely ripped apart by losing your children. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think putting those children in really raises the stakes. And not only would I have the children just in one, I'd have them in every scene um, with, with, with Wendell. And in fact, the, the scene where Wendell first appears, that scene where that starts with Frankfurt saying, oh, I'm, I have such a great life. Not only would I have, I'd have one child running around and then I'd have um, Anne pregnant with the second child when she first gets seduced, well, seduced, uh, uh, when Wendell first starts um, hitting on her, uh, just to kind of really um, underlie the fact that, you know, she, she is this, this uh, you know, happily married woman with these children and, you know, this is a flourishing marriage. And I, I, she, the, the, it is, we are just getting the bare bones, but they are good bones. and. Personally, from from my putting my director's head on for a moment, like sometimes just as long as the bones are decent bones that it's actually more helpful as a director than having a lot of writing that half of it, you just think, oh, my God, I need to cut. I need to cut half of this out. Like mm. you, you can do so much with bare bones. Um, and I think there's a lot to be done with this. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting the way the, the, the play is structured. It, it does seem to structure, uh, follow a certain sort of uh, uh, melodrama beats. And that's not a, to, you know, to, uh, as an insult to, uh, uh, you know, I'm not, yeah, I'm using that as a, as a effectively a, a genre term in the sense that the, 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 there's an awful lot of people who believe absolutely in one thing and they're heading in one direction until they don't. And the play isn't interested in that psychological transition they are interested in the effects they are interested in the the presentation um and that's sort of what's happened in that last scene there's so much of there is is for effect and and affect um and that seems to be what the text is doing and and how do we play around with that in 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 a modern uh, take is is interesting uh anyway we need to move on we've got still got quite a chunk to read so mm -hmm. act five scene one enter sir charles montford gentleman like and his susan gentlewoman like Brother, why have you tricked me like a bride? Bought me this gay attire, these ornaments? Forget you our state, our poverty? Call me not, brother, but imagine me some barbarous outlaw or uncivil kern. For if, you, if thou shuttest thine eyes and only hearest the words that I shall utter, thou shalt judge me some starring ruffian, not thy brother Charles. Oh, sister. Oh, brother, what does this strange language mean? Dost love me, sister? Wouldst thou see me live a bankrupt beggar in the world's disgrace and die indebted to mine enemies? Wouldst thou behold me stand like a huge beam in the world's eye, a byword and a scorn? It lies in thee, of these 
to acquit me free, and all my debt I may outstrip by thee. By me? Why, I have nothing, nothing left. I owe it even for the clothes upon my back. I am not worth. Oh, sister, say not so. It lies in you, my downcast state to raise, to make me stand on even points with the world. Come, sister, you are rich, indeed you are, and in your power you have, without delay, Acton's 500 pounds back to repay. Till now I had thought you loved me. By my honour, which I have kept as spotless as the moon, I ne'er was mistress of that single doit, which I reserved not to supply your wants. And do you think that I would hoard from you? Now, by my hopes in heaven, know I the means to buy you from the slavery of your debts, especially from Acton, who I hate. I will redeem it with my life or blood. I challenge it, and kindred set apart, thus ruffian-like I lay siege to thy heart. What do I owe to Acton? Why, some 500 pounds, towards which I swear, in all the world I have not one denier. It will not prove so, sister, now resolve me. What do you think, and speak your conscience? Would Acton give, might he enjoy your bed? He would not shrink to spend a thousand pound to give the Mountford's name so deep a wound. A thousand pound, I but 500 owe. Grant him your bed, he's paid with interest, so. Oh, brother. Oh, sister, I only this one way with that rich jewel you my debts may pay. In speaking this, my cold heart shakes with shame, nor do I woo you in, my brother, in a brother's name, but in a stranger's. Shall I die in debt to act in my grand foe and you still wear that precious jewel that he holds so dear? My honor I esteem as dear and precious as my redemption. I esteem you, sister, as dear for so pr dear prizing it. Will Charles have me cut off my hands and send them Acton? Rip up my breast and with my bleeding heart present him as a token? Neither, sister, but hear me in my strange assertion. Thy honor and my soul are equal in my regard, nor will thy brother Charles survive thy shame. His kindness like a burden hath surcharged me, and under his good deeds I stooping go, not with an upright soul. Had I remained in prison still, there doubtless I had died. Then unto him that freed me from that prison, still do I owe this life. What moved my foe to enfranchise me? "'Twas, sister, for your love. "'With full five hundred pounds he bought your love. "'And shall he not enjoy it? "'Shall the weight of all this heavy burden lean on me? "'And will not you bear part? "'You did partake the joy of my release. "'Will you not stand in joint bond bound to satisfy the debt? "'Shall I be only charged?' But that I know these arguments come from an honoured mind, as in your most extremity of need, scorning to stand in debt to one you hate. Nay, rather would engage your unsustained honour than to be held in grit. I should condemn you. I see your resolution and assent. So Charles will have me, and I am content. For this I tricked you up. But here's a knife. To save mine honour, shall slice out my life. I know thou pleasest me a thousand times more in that resolution than, my, than thy grant. Observe her love to soothe it to my suit. Her honor she will hazard, though not lose. To bring me out of debt, her rigorous hand will pierce her heart. Oh, wonder what will choose rather than stain her blood, her life to lose. Come, you sad sister, to a woeful brother. This is the gate. I'll bear him such a present, such an acquaintance for the night to seal, as will amaze his senses and surprise with admiration all his fantasies. Enter Sir Francis Acton and Mulby. Before his unchaste thoughts shall seize on me, tis here shall my imprisoned soul set free. How? Mountford with his sister, hand in hand? What miracles afoot? It is a sight begets in me much admiration. Stand not amazed to see me thus attended. Act and I owe thee money, and being unable to bring thee the full sum in ready coin, lo, for thy more assurance here's upon. My sister, my dear sister, whose chaste honor I prize above a million. Here, nay, take her. She's worth your money. 
Man, do not forsake her. I would he were in earnest. Impute it not to my immodesty, my brother, being rich in nothing else, but in his interest that he hath in me, according to his poverty hath brought you, me, all his store, whom, howsoe'er you prize, as forfeit to your hand, he values highly, and would not sell but to acquit your debt for any emperor's ransom. Stern heart, relent thy former cruelty, at length repent. Was ever known in any former age such honourable rested courtesy? Lands, honours, life, and all the world forego, rather than stand engaged to such a foe? Acton, she is too poor to be thy bride, and I too much opposed to be thy brother. There, take her to thee. If thou hast the heart to seize her as a rape or a lustful prey, to blur our house that never yet was stained, to murder her that never meant thee harm, to kill me now, whom once thou savest from death, do them at once. On her all these rely, and perish with her spotless chastity. You overcome me in your love, Sir Charles. I cannot be so cruel to a lady, to, to a lady I love so dearly. Since you have not spared to engage your reputation to the world, your sister's honour, which you prize so dear, nay, all the comforts which you hold on earth, to grow out of my debt, being your foe, your honoured thoughts, lo, thus I recompense. Your metamorphosed foe receives your gift in satisfaction of all former wrongs, this jewel I will wear here in my heart, and where before I thought her for her wants, too base to be my bride, to end all strife, I seal you, my dear brother, her my wife. You still exceed us. I will yield to fate, and learn to love where I till now did hate. With that enchantment you have charmed my soul and made me rich, even in those very words. I pay no debt, but am indebted more. Rich in your love, I never can be poor. All's mine is yours. We are alike in state. Let's knit in love what was opposed in hate. Come, for our nuptials we will straight provide, blessed only in our brother and fair bride. And exit. Wow. There's a... There's <laughs> a see, Charles, what a brother. <laughs> what a brother to have in your corner there. Um, ye, ye yeah. gods. Um, uh, hear me in my strange assertion. Mm, yeah, I mean, it, I, I, I put in the chat, is it has a sort of Abraham and Isaac vibe. The moment Susan comes on and says, brother, why have you tricked me like a bride? Um, <laughs> it's, 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 why are we walking... Why am I dressed like I'm going to a wedding? Um, oh shit. Um, right. Yeah. And then it just gets worse and worse and worse. I've just written yikes eek. Um, uh, 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 just, yeah. Um, any thoughts from the room before we rapidly move on, Lynn? Yeah, I don't envy the actor who has to play. Um... Okay. The, you know, the would-be rapist, whatever his name is, I forget. Acton. Uh, Acton. Yeah, Act Acton. Because, like, making that conversion to, you know what? I'll just marry her. Uh, it, making that persuasive, that's a challenge. Yeah, it does feel like the whole thing is sort of structured. Again, I was talking about these 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 beats of extremity uh, that the player is throwing us back and forth from, and it does seem, again, deliberate. Um and yeah, I mean, it does feel like Susan is in a totally different scene from everybody else. Um, it doesn't feel that what they're saying relates to anything she's saying. Uh, briefly, Lois, Alexandra and Sarah. I think it's one of these awful contests of generosity. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I offer you my sister, go ahead and rape her or whatever. Uh, but I'm but meanwhile, he knows that she's planning to kill herself anyway, and he wouldn't be happy if she didn't. And uh, then Francis says, well, I can't let you be this noble. So I've got to be noble. And, and Susan says, good heavens, you're so noble. I'll learn to love you now. I mean, the whole thing. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Alexandra. 
Um, I feel like nobody's in any doubt that this is an exchange of, of sex for money. Um, and it, I appreciate that no one's in any doubt. Like, the, it's disgusting to, to watch the scene where brother and sister negotiate exactly how much she's worth, worth. And then the language that he uses in giving her away is very, you know, um, uh, she's worth your gold. Here, have her. Um, I would not sell her but to acquit my debt. Um, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, that's, yeah, that is him. Um, I also wanted to point out something we've been talking about in the chat, which is that this scene and indeed what's been happening generally um, in relationship in relation to these women is all about the men. Mm. So, Charles says, look, she's too poor to be your bride, but rape her. Why don't you? Um, to which Francis responds, you overcome me in your love, Sir Charles. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? <laughs> I mean, yes, that's that's all I wanted to say. Um, the fact, and Susan is up for that. that that's, that's her perspective as well, is that she as a person is only worth what she is useful as an object to um, uh, her brother and respectively to this dude. Mm. It's horrible. Mm. Uh, Sarah, then Lynn, then we will move on. I don't necessarily agree that she's up for it um i she has uh, after after this little revelation has been made she has two lines where she talks about yielding to fate but yielding to fate can be kind of that that's a, that's a very ambiguous line because she was talking um a, a minute before about uh like killing herself um and I think again, yeah, again, there's a lot of interpretation to be had here. I think she could, she could say these lines in a way that makes it clear to the audience that she is still going to kill herself. She's basically saying this um, in order to kind of, you know, play the part. Um, but you know, she's got that knife concealed about her person, and if we see her, you know, hot clutch it. As, as she says the lines, that's going to give the scene a very different um, uh, context. I mean, I, I just put a, a, a joke in, in the chat saying, Susan, use that knife to stab them both. Um, <laughs> but, right. but you know, that, I, I mean, actually, that is the joy of 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 a very um spare language. You know, you could she could be clutching the knife and and the audience are thinking she's going to she's still going to kill herself. Maybe she's just going to kill both of them the minute they all get off stage. I don't know. They're probably going to come back at the end and they'll be married and it'll be all happy and all right. But like, you know, if this, uh, I'm just, we're quite near the end of the play now. Depending on what happens in the final scene, like you, you could, you could make this very, very ambiguous, but we'll, we'll see. Mm. Yes, we've uh, we've discussed uh, just random brutal uh, murders at the end of a play to, to to make it all end happily ever after. So uh, hey, it looks like we we might have another one. Um, get out the comedy stoning scene, uh, Lynn. I don't think when um, the brother says, "Yeah, go ahead and rape her," he I don't think he means that literally. I think he says, "Well, do that if you're that kind of person." He's basically saying, yeah, if you want to be the kind of guy who who coerces women into having sex, be that guy. Fine. Um, so, you know, puts him in a position that, 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 you know, yeah, do it, but you're going to be, yeah, go ahead. But that makes you a rapist. Um, and, um, and the other thing that I think is really interesting about this scene is that you almost can't help as someone viewing it to realize that all marriage, legitimate marriage, is transactional. Mm. We put the uh, we we put a, a little you know stamp of approval on it, but particularly in this period, the exchange of property, the dower, the dowry, all of that was highly important. Mm. I mean, even today, you know, how long do you wait when you're hanging out in the pub when you meet somebody before you say, so what do you do for a living? Mm. Uh, you know? Sarah, bullet points only, please. <laughs> yes, just one more thing that I forgot to say earlier. I think there are really interesting parallels in this contest of generosity with the um, falconry scene that uh, kicked off this whole thing. <laughs> or at least you could make really interesting parallels, this kind of joshing for 
supremacy um, by, you know, using the generosity to kind of show their um, superiority. Okay, we're going to move on to the next two scenes, one after the other. Act five, scene two, enter Cranwell, Frankfurt and Nicholas. Why do you search each room about your house now that you have dispatched your wife away? Oh, sir, to see that nothing may be left that ever was my wife's. I loved her dearly, and when I do but think of her unkindness, my thoughts are all in hell, to avoid which torment I would not have a bodkin or a cuff, a bracelet necklace or rabata wire, nor anything that ever was called hers left to me by which I might remember her. Seek, round about. Blood, master, here's her lute flung in a corner. Her lute, oh God, upon this instrument her fingers have run, rung quick division, sweeter than that which now divides our hearts. These frets have made me pleasant, but have now frets and by heartstrings made. Oh, Master Cranwell, oft hath she made this melancholy wood now mute and dumb for her disastrous chance. Speak sweetly many a note, sound many a strain to her own ravishing voice, which being well strung, what air, pleasant strange airs have they jointly sung. Post with it after her. Now nothing's left of her and hers I am at once bereft. I'll ride and overtake her, do my message and come back again. Exit Nicholas. Meantime, sir, if you please, I'll to Sir Francis Acton and inform him of what hath passed betwixt you and his sister. Do as you please. How ill am, am I bested to be a widower ere my wife be dead? And they exit. Act 5, scene 3. Enter Mistress Anne Frankford with Jenkin, her maid Cecily, her coachman and three carters. I bid my coach stay. Why should I ride in state, being hurled so low down by the hand of fate? A seat like to my fortunes let me have. Earth for my chair and for my bed a grave. Frankford, good mistress. You have ordered your coach with tears already. You have but two miles now to go to your manor. A man cannot say by my old master Frankford, as he may say by me, that he wants manners, for he hath three or four, of which this is one that we are going to now. Good mistress, be of good cheer. Sorrow, you see, hurts you, but helps you not. We all mourn to see you so sad. Oh, mistress, I spy one of my landlord's men come riding post. Tis like he brings some news. Comes he from Master Frankford, he is welcome. So is his news, because they come from him. Enter Nicholas. There. Ah, I know the lute. Oft have I sung to thee. We both are out of tune, both out of time. Would that had been the worst instrument that e'er you played on? My master commends him to ye. There's all that he can find was ever yours. He hath nothing left that ever you could lay claim to, but his own heart. And he could afford you that. All that I have to deliver you is this. He prays you to forget him, and so bids you farewell. I thank him. He is kind and ever was. All you that have true feeling of my grief, that know my loss and have relenting hearts, gird me about and help me with your tears to wash my spotted sins. My lute shall groan. It cannot weep, but shall lament my moan. She plays. Enter Wendell from behind. Pursued with horror of a guilty soul and with a sharp scourge of repentance lashed, I fly from mine own shadow. <clears throat> oh, my stars, what have my parents in their lives deserved that you should lay this penance on their son? When I but think of Master Frankfurt's love and lay it to my treason or compare my murdering him for his relieving me, it strikes a terror like a lightning flash to scorch my blood up. Thus I, like the owl, ashamed of day, live in these shadowy woods, afraid of every leaf or murmuring blast, yet longing to receive some perfect knowledge how he had dealt with her. Seeing Mistress Frankfurt. <clears throat> oh, my sad fate, <clears throat> here and so far from home, and thus attended. Oh, God, 
I have divorced the truest turtles that ever lived together and being divided in several places make their several moan. She in the fields laments and he at home. So poets write that Orpheus made the trees and stories to dance to his melodious harp, meaning the rustic and the barbarous hinds that had no understanding part in them. So she from these rude carters tears extracts, making their flinty hearts with grief to rise and draw down rivers from their rocky eyes. Uh, if you return unto my master, Say, though not from me, for I am all unworthy to blast his name so with a strumpet's tongue, that you have seen me weep, wish myself dead. Nay, you may say too, for my vow is past, last night you saw me eat and drink my last. This to your master you may say and swear, for it is written heaven and decreed here. I'll say you wept. I'll swear you made me sad. Why, how now, eyes, what how? What's here to do? I'm gone, or I shall straight turn baby too. Cannot weep, my heart is all on fire. Cursed be the fruits of my unchaste desire. Go oh, break this lute upon my coach's wheel as the last music that I e'er shall make. Not as my husband's gift, but my farewell to all earth's joy. And so your master tell. If I can for crying. Grief have done, or like a madman, I shall frantic run. You have beheld the woefulest wretch on earth, a woman made of tears. Would you had words to express but what you see. My inward grief, no tongue can utter. Yet unto your power you may describe my sorrow and disclose to thy sad master my abundant woes. I'll do your commendations. Oh no, I dare not so presume, nor to my children. I am disclaimed in both. Alas, I am. Oh, never teach them when they come to speak to name the name of mother. Chide their tongue if they by chance light on that hated word. Tell them tis not, for when that word they name, poor pretty souls, they harp on their own shame. To re recompense their wrongs, what canst thou do? Thou hast made her husbandless and childless too. I have no more to say. Speak not for me. Yet you may tell your master what you see. I'll do it. Exit Nicholas. I'll speak to her and comfort her in grief. Oh, but her wound cannot be cured with words. No matter though, I'll do my best goodwill to work a cure on her whom I did kill. So now unto my coach, then to my home, so to my deathbed. For from this sad hour, I never will nor eat, nor drink, nor taste of any cates that may preserve my life. I never will, nor smile, nor sleep, nor rest. But when my tears have washed my black soul white, sweet Savior, to thy hands I yield my sprite. Oh, Mistress Frankfurt. Ah, for God's sake, fly! The devil doth come to tempt me ere I die. My coach, this sin that with an angel's face conjured my honor till he sought my rack, in my repentant eye seems ugly, black. Exuant all except Wendell and Jenkin, the carters whistling. What, my young master that fled in his shirt? How come ye you buy your clothes again? You have made our house in a sweet pickle, how ye not, think you? What? Shall I serve thee still, or cleave to the old house? Hence, slave. Away with thy unseasoned mirth, unless thou canst shed tears and sigh and howl, curse thy sad fortunes and exclaim on fate, thou art not for my turn. Marry, and you will not, another will. Farewell and be hanged. Would you had never come to have kept this coil within our doors. We shall have you run away like a sprite again. Exit, Jenkin. She's gone to death. I live to want and woe. Her life, her sins, and all upon my head. And I must now go wander like Cain in foreign countries and remote climes where the report of my ingratitude cannot be heard. 
I'll over first to France and so to Germany and Italy, where when I have recovered and by travel gotten those perfect tongues and that these rumors may in their height abate, I will return and I divine, however now dejected, my worth and parts being by some great man praised at my return, I may in court be raised. Exit Wendell. All sorts of interestingly slightly conflicting things going on there there's it's 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 again it's a scene looking for effect i mean the whole thing of Anne playing while uh you know the loot that's just been returned following the previous scene with the husband going around the house going where what what stuff's left behind um and then we have wendell who mostly doesn't talk to her uh he tries to talk to her and she just goes yeah get behind these satan um and wendell does does seem genuinely repentant at times and then of course but then his repentance is also based entirely on his own personal selfishness and it sort of it tips his hand at the very very end there mm. so it's not so much repenting what he's done he's repenting that he got caught mm. um yeah. and he, he needs to rebuild his reputation abroad um because that's the only place he can do it um but yeah um uh thoughts in the room alexandra then lynn on the subject of building his reputation abroad, it seems incredibly precise. This this fabulous <laughs> plan that he has, um, and um, I think I, I can't remember whether we brought this up in on the video yesterday. Whether or not this is supposed to be based on or suggestive of uh, anything sort of contemporary, as in contemporary to the writer, any sort of actual you know, no celebrities were harmed. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't know of any. Uh, the, the, I, I, it all seems to be mostly fictional, so but there might be uh, things that are going on. Uh, Bryony, Elizabeth, then Sarah, and then we'll. Uh, oh no, sorry, Lynn. Uh, then Bryony, then Elizabeth, then Sarah. Ever quickly, please, everyone, because we still have a scene to go. Yeah, yeah. What I was going to say is, I think what the playwright is, is is trying to do here is basically kind of a split screen effect, but they didn't have that convention at the time. So Wendell's reaction to the way things fell out and her reaction, he just wants both of those on stage at the same time. And they don't have the convention that you have two different spaces on stage at the same time. So mm. you can't quite uh, do it. Well, we occasionally have, have, have had splits, uh, uh, splits, yeah. uh, split stages, but um, I'm sure we've had at least one. Um, uh, it, but <laughs> don't ask me to remember. Eric will probably remember which one it was. <laughs> uh, Bryony, then Elizabeth and Sarah. Yeah. Jew of Malta. Yeah. That wasn't the one I was thinking of, but uh, good, good, yeah. The, but yes, uh, the brownie. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, I can't remember whether it was said, verbalised or whether it was all just said in chat, but somebody has already said somewhere that uh, they would, if they were doing this, they would put make more of the lute and, and have her playing music throughout. And I think that really, that's a very, very good decision. I agree with that. Like, especially having now had that scene, I think it, it would just make that scene so much more. Mm. Uh, and I also like the way I say, destroy this loot off stage. Um, <laughs> where, where, so that we don't destroy the prop. Thank you very much. Uh, Elizabeth. Yeah, um, just very briefly. It's very dynamic. The place of women in this play is something very unique and unusual. It's just to do with like the women under the patriarchy they do have agency and they do have like sort of assertiveness in the play, but it's kind of like under the umbrella of the men. So it's an interesting dynamic there. Mm. Uh, Sarah. Um, I also like uh, Alexandra noticed the preciseness of uh, Wendell's plan there, but I think it kind of, uh, it, it just sort of shows that he's thought about it. I think it's quite an interesting characterization note because it's like he's perhaps done this before and thought that he's he was going to get caught and perhaps didn't. So he's like, oh, I need to make sure I always have a plan, an escape plan, so that uh, you know when I've when I've done my raking, I, I I have a plan B. And in this particular case, he just he has to use his plan B. But it's interesting that it, he does have it all sorted out I, i'm not so sure I, the, the the feeling i got from this is this is someone who's never actually faced the consequences of mm. this kind of thing um uh, I, I i don't get the impression you know he i think he is genuinely having feelings i mean they're selfish feelings um for the most part he does occasionally go oh my god i've ruined her life um he you know he does actually acknowledge that um but then he just 
pings back to himself. I, I suspect he's never actually quite gone this far before um, because I think he would have explicitly boasted or done something to give that, that indication. But, hey, it's your production. You can do what you like. <laughs> uh, very briefly, Eric. I was just going to say that, that that last line, uh, my return, I mean, court be raised is a bit like sort of wishful thinking, but also kind of, oh, yeah, it will all be forgotten by the time I get back. It will, uh, you know, sort of the, the right to be forgotten kind of thing, which is actually a thing in uh, journalism nowadays. Yeah, I, I think, you know, he'll go on the chat circuit. He'll talk about how he's changed and it'll be fine. Um, and... Uh, yeah, that double standard would, would definitely be alive. Anyway, we have a scene to go. Act 5, scene 4, enter Sir Francis Acton, Sir Charles Mumford, Cranwell, Mulby and Susan. Brother, and now my wife, I think these troubles fall on my head by justice of the heavens, for being so strict to you in your extremities. But we are now atoned. I would my sister could with like happiness overcome her griefs as we have ours. You tell us, Master Cranwell, wondrous things touching the patience of that gentleman, with what strange virtue he demeans his grief. I told you what I was a witness of. It was my fortune to lodge there that night. Oh, that same villain, Wendell. "'Twas his tongue that did corrupt her. "'She was of herself chaste and devoted well. "'Is this the house?' "'Yes, sir. I take it. "'Here your sister lies.' "'My brother Frankford showed too, mu too mild a spirit "'in the revenge of such a loathed crime. "'Less than he did, no man of spirit could do. "'I am so far from blaming his revenge that I commend it. "'Had it been my case, their souls at once "'had from their breasts been freed. "'Death to such deeds of shame is the due meed.'" Enter Jinkin and Cicely. "'Oh, my mistress, mistress, my poor mistress.'" "'Alas, that ever I was born, "'what shall I do for my poor mistress?' "'Why, what of her?' Oh, Lord, sir, she no sooner heard that her brother and her friends had come to see how she did, but she, for very shame of her guilty conscience, fell into such a swoon that we had much ado to get life in her. Alas, that she should bear so hard a fate. Pity it is repentance comes too late. Is she so weak in body? Oh, sir, I can assure you there's no hope of life in her, for she will take no sustenance. She hath plainly starved herself, and now she's lean as a lady. She ever looks for the good hour. Many gentlemen and gentlewomen of the country are come to comfort her. And enter Mistress Anne Frankfurt in her bed. How fare you, Mistress Frankfurt? Sick, sick, oh, sick. Give me some air, I pray you. Tell me, oh, tell me, where is Master Frankfurt? Will he not deign to see me ere I die? Yes, Mistress Frankfurt. Diverse gentlemen, your loving neighbours, with that just request have moved and told him of your weak estate, who, though with much ado to get belief examining of the general circumstance, seeing your sorrow and your penitence and hearing with all the great desire you have to see him ere you left the world, he gave us to his faith to follow us. And sure he will be here immediately. You half revived me with the pleasing news. Raise me a little higher in my bed. Blush I not, Brother Acton? Blush I not, Sir Charles? Can you not read my fault writ in my cheek? Is not my crime there? Tell me, gentlemen. Alas, good mistress, sickness hath not left you blood in your face enough to make you blush. Then sickness, like a friend, my fault would hide. Is my husband come? My soul but tarries his arrive. Then I am fit for heaven. I came to chide you, but my words of hate are turned to pity and compassionate grief. I came to rate you, but my brawls, you see, melt into tears, and I must weep by thee. 
Here's Master Frankfurt now. Enter Frankfurt. Good morrow, brother. Morrow, gentlemen. God that hath laid this cross upon our heads might, had he pleased, have made co our course of meeting on a more fair and more contented ground. But he that hath made us, made us to this world. And, and is he come? Methinks that voice I know. How do you, woman? Well, Master Frankfurt, well, but shall be better, I hope, within this hour. Will you vouchsafe out of your grace and your humanity to take a spotted strumpet by the hand? This hand once held my heart in foster bonds and now it is gripped by me. God pardon them that made us first break hold. Amen, amen. Out of my zeal to heaven, whither I'm now bound, I was so impudent to wish you here and, and once more beg your pardon. Oh, good man and father to my children, <coughs> pardon me, pardon, oh, pardon me. My fault so heinous is that if you in this world forgive it not, heaven will not clear it in the world to come. Faintness hath so usurped upon my knees that kneel I cannot, but on my heart's knees, my prostrate soul lies thrown down at your feet to beg your gracious pardon. Pardon, oh, pardon me. As freely from the low depth of my soul as my Redeemer hath forgiven his death, I pardon thee. I will shed tears for thee, pray with thee, and in mere pity of thy weak estate, I'll wish to die with thee. So do we all. So do we all. Nicholas? We've had some escaping text again. Uh, Lin, you're muted at present. Are you with us? So will not I? So will not I. I'll sigh and sob, but by my faith, not die. Oh, Master Frankfurt, all the near alliance I lose by her shall be supplied in thee. You are my brother by the nearest way. Her kindred hath fallen off, but yours doth stay. Even as I hope for pardon at that day when the great judge of heaven in scarlet sits, so be thou pardoned. Though thy rash friends divorce our bodies, thy repentant tears unite our souls. Then comfort, Mistress Frankfurt. You see your husband hath forgiven your fall. Then rouse your spirit and cheer your fainting soul. How is it with you? How do you feel yourself? Not of this world. I see you are not, and I weep to see it. My, my wife, the mother to my pretty babes, both those lost names I do restore thee back. And with this kiss, I wed thee once again. Though thou art wounded in thy honoured name, and with that grief upon thy deathbed liest, honest in heart, upon my soul I thou diest. Pardon on earth, soul, thou in heaven art free. Once more thy wife dies thus, embracing thee. And dies. New married and new widowed, oh, she's dead, and a cold grave must be her nuptial bed. Sir, be of good comfort, and your heavy sorrow part equally amongst us. Storms divided abate their force, and with less rage are guided. Do, Master Frankford, he that hath least part will find enough to drown one troubled heart. Peace with thee, Nan. Brothers and gentlemen, all we can... All we that can plead interest in her grief bestow upon her body funeral tears. Brother, had you with threats and usage bad punished her sin, the grief of her offence had not with such true sorrow touched her heart. I see it had not, therefore on her grave will I bestow this funeral epitaph, which on her marble tomb shall be engraved in golden letters 
shall these words be filled to your lives, she whom her husband's kindness killed. And we have an epilogue. Alexandra, would you like to read some text? Yay! An honest crew, disposed to be merry, came to a tavern by and called for wine. The drawer brought it, smiling like a cherry, and told them it was pleasant, neat, and fine. Taste it, quoth one. He did so. Fie, quoth he. This wine was good. Now it runs too near the lee. Another sipped to give the wine his due, and said unto the rest, It drunk too flat. The third said it was old, the fourth too new. Nay, quoth the fifth, the sharpness likes me not. Thus, gentlemen, you see how in one hour the wine was new, old, flat, sharp, sweet, and sour. Unto this wine we do allude our play, which some will judge too trivial, some too grave. You, as our guests, we entertain this day, and bid you welcome to the best we have. Excuse us, then. Good wine may be disgraced when every several mouth hath sundry taste. <laughs> Once again, I'm really liking the epilogues and the prologue to this play. I think they're both really good generic epilogues and prologues, um, and that they do really clever things. I, I, and it's, it, it's always an interesting question about epilogues and prologues. Do they really belong to this play, or are they just random texts that have got attached to this particular play? They're both very, very good. I like the epilogue. Now <laughs> someone else can talk about the play. Uh, so, um, yeah, so Padme died. Um, it's Revenge of the Sith all over again. Um, yeah, Anakin can get blasted into pieces and still come back. And Padme just, just randomly just dies. Why? Because. Um, so, yeah. Um, sorry, making Star Wars references. Uh, I will move on. Bryony. uh <laughs> And other people. Yeah, the Charles is, um, you know, why don't you just rape my sister since she's got not good enough to marry line was completely trumped unexpectedly by Francis's, well, if it was me, I'd just kill my sister. Mm. Oh. <laughs> Charming people. Charming people. Uh, Eric. Yeah, I don't know about this. <laughs> no, yeah, I just... Um... It's kind of okay. Frankfurt has forgiven her and then sort of she realized she, her husband's kind of killed. But hey, it's not my fault. It was the way God devised things, of course. And yeah, I, I don't know. There's just like sort of, it just kind of doesn't really take responsibility for it, does it? Does he? Uh, except maybe, maybe on that last line, but not entirely. Well, there is an interesting question here about uh, how responsible Frankfurt is for for what 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 goes on here. I mean, you said you could argue on paper that he was, uh, you know, that his 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 punishment for for adultery within that context was was in fact very very merciful, um, and you couldn't really predict that this was going to be the outcome for that, and that there is genuine grief on both sides as to the breaking up and the separation of, of forces, um, whether that wholly runs through with the then dying randomly for of, of grief on, on the bed at the end which feels again we're leaning towards the melodrama melodrama end of things um is is a, a i think open for discussion uh lois then lynn yeah well she it's not altogether random she starved herself to death hasn't mm. she i mean she said that's what she was going to do mm. and uh, so i think that there is a kind of uh, point to it um i mean the the phrase to kill someone with kindness was proverbial so the uh, the play is, in a sense, acting that out. Uh, I think it's partly that what Frankfurt wants is uh, is also to to save her soul. I mean, to bring her to a state of repentance. I mean, that whole scene is really about her feeling that if he doesn't forgive her on earth, she can't be forgiven in heaven, and she can only die happy if she feels that uh, uh, that that he has forgiven her. And then there's that idea that they're being married again. You know, uh, that they've been divorced by by her action, and now they're married again in the last seconds of her life. I mean, I think all this, if, if you can buy into it, is quite moving. I mean, the, the trouble is we don't altogether buy into it. I think we buy into it a, a lot more than we do with, say, um, uh, uh, the Francis and Susan plotline, uh, which, which is, is just sort of enters this scene like this, this awfully bad smell. Uh, <laughs> just going, oh, we're supposed to be happy with this resolution, are we? Are we really? Mm. Eek. Uh, Lynn. 
yeah, the Francis Susan thing is hard. You know, maybe this is just me, but um, particularly the scene um, where um, Frankfurt eventually ends up with his 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 verdict, where he first confronts Anne with what she's done. It kind of reminds me of a scene from a. a <laughs> A 90s TV, American TV movie called Divorce Wars. There's a scene with a, a couple who are in the midst of a divorce and they're attorneys. And the couple are arguing about who gets to keep the ceramic elephant that sits on the hearth. And the woman's like, I bought it with my own money when I was working, I want it. And the husband's like, you gave it to me as a gift, I want it. And the lawyers are like, you know, you're paying us $150 an hour to do this settlement and you guys are arguing over a knickknack. And the couple start to cry. Mm -hmm. It's, I mean, that knickknack is sort of it, it, it embodies how really impossible it is to make a clean break when you've been in an intimate relationship. And that scene reminded me of that. You know, the, the sort of horrible gender politics aside, it really made, made me think of that moment when a marriage fails. And that's so painful for everyone. Fault notwithstanding it that almost doesn't matter it just hurts hmm. uh, on the thoughts Kyle I uh, you know I, what one thing I find interesting that this play made me realize is that whole repentance scene for the good death kind of Puritan stuff that's going on here um with it often in in Puritan texts is very um concentrated on like the agency of the person dying and their relationship with you know realizations and stuff like that which seems very kind of pro-feminine in some ways even though this is like clearly fetishizing chastity and all that stuff in some ways <laughs> interesting elements to it in that way mm. uh elizabeth yeah um I just found, I just found the ending actually quite satisfying. Um, I was I've been watching Obi Wan Kenobi, and I was just thinking about your reference to Padme, and apparently she lost the will to live, mm. Rob. So there was a reason, yeah. <laughs> not a medical one. Yeah. Also, 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 technically, she wasn't supposed to die at that point because there's references to uh, the uh, uh, being alive the, remembering their mother and stuff. Anyway, um, well, uh, yeah, yeah. Don't. This is painful stuff. Don't talk to about the first trilogy, uh, the, the, the 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 prequel trilogy. Anyway, uh, Alexandra. Um, I just wanted to uh, point out that um, even at the very last, the very, very last word is Frankfurt telling the audience he's going to write an epitaph for his wife and say, here lies she whom her husband's kindness killed. He's the one who decided that what he did was kind and that's what killed her. Um, and um, this entire play has, has been, you know, as I was saying, these, these men thinking about themselves. Um, but the fact that Wendell has no he he has some sort of pangs of conscience and decides to go away and then one person says he was a bit bad for attempting her to do that wasn't he anyway moving on um there are no consequences to him there's no pursuit of him uh and there is no blame attached to him by practically everyone in the the last few scenes who all agree that the blame is squarely on Anne um, and I think there's, yeah, the, the play definitely is doing some things. In a modern production, you might want to insist on those and kind of go, look at how erroneous this line of judgment is. Mm. Um, I mean, I mean, yeah, just leading into the fact, you know, this is a tragedy and it's a tragedy in ways that maybe the author didn't fully intend. Um, uh... Yeah, sorry, sorry, I cut you off. Uh, any... But I think that the things that don't satisfy us could be used in, in, in intentionally yeah. in ways that don't make them more satisfying, because that's the point. Mm. Especially, you know, that appearance of uh, at the end in that final scene of Francis and Susan of just going, no, OK, this situation is horrible. Let's let's lean into the horribleness of how horrible that is, that this play doesn't end in a way that is anyway um, uh, nice. Uh, Lois, then Eric. Mm. Yeah, I was just going to say that the real condemnation of Wendell that I think carries most is that of the servants. I mean, it's uh, it's really quite effective the way that they're used just to give a kind of straight, you know, tell it like it is feeling about the thing. 
Yes, Nicholas does undermine a lot uh, of the, especially at the very end there. I like, you know, I, I, I'll wish to die with thee. And Nicholas goes, well, I don't want to die. I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll do some crying if I can. Can I just do some crying because I'm sad? That is that that good enough? Cheers. Um, and yeah, so he, there, there is an element that the servants are, are undercutting a lot. Um, it's, it is a shame that in many ways the potential of the servants isn't fully realised as, as they could be, actually. there's There's a lot more there but i think there's definitely enough to play there are definitely parts i'd like to have um in a, in a way uh that some of the other parts though on paper look good uh are sort of going oh god what does one do with this um eric uh, i was just going to mention what i said from you know all the chat stuff that we've talking about like uh, that we've been talking about in the chat sort of uh, you know starvation being sort of seen as a way of purification and that kind of stuff i was going to mention something completely different um and uh talk about how um Anne's line to take a spotted strumpet by the hand made me thought think instantly of one of the only places where we've actually seen that spotting on, on um, um happen on stage which was three ladies of london um if I'm not mistaken, um, I hope, yeah. um, <laughs> where uh, one of the women, one of the three most honourable ladies was kind of... Um, Conscience. Yeah. Conscience, yeah. Yeah, it was basically literally spotted. Um, now obviously, it's it's an expression, but like the, the, they make a big show of it in, in that play. And there's a problem going, okay, so have they actually like has something like further happened to Anne or like, is that a description of her as a sort of, uh, not character, but as a sort of, um, as a sort of, well, obviously she's besmirched her honor by doing this her, and her husband's honor in this play. Um, but then, um, yeah, is that a description of what she looks like at this moment in time, basically what I'm asking, which mm. is very shallow. Uh, so I'm not going to go around the hot. Oh, uh, Elizabeth. Oh, very, very quickly. Oh, no, um, go, 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 Eric and Lois for remembering that. That was amazing. Um, <laughs> but I just wanted to um, just to draw this contrast between kindness and mercy. And I think it was Alexandra that said, "Who decides what's kind anyway?" Um, you know, and I thought that was really interesting that the mercy from men cannot absolve the sins of a woman. It, um, a man can can go away with no consequences at all, like Wendell does, but the woman has to die to kind of be absolved of her sins. Mm. Uh, yes. Uh, other thoughts in the room? Uh, I'm not going to go around the whole room for final thoughts. Uh, I'm just going to move in the general direction of uh, uh, thoughts about um, uh, staging this um, because it has had uh, a fair number of uh, modern revivals and, and, and the question of how how that lands and how it plays. This is definitely a play. It's not often that I uh, go to a play and go, you know, I think definitely we need to go for original um, uh, setting time uh, period stuff. I, I, I would dread to try and, oh, let's set this in the modern day, because I think that would just, just, just wouldn't work. I think this is one way you're talking about a period, you're talking about it, you're not talking about it uncritically, but where that is perhaps the, the, the most logical uh, direction to, uh, to take a staging is to look at this Elizabethan world uh, and see what it's saying and and present the text pretty much as is um, and and you know and lean into the the horrors and, uh, of what's going on because it's not a comedy this is the advantage we've we've done quite a few comedies where we've had the real problem of going how do we make people laugh mm. um, at this this world uh, that exists full of all the, the the problems that it has whereas this isn't a comedy uh it may have the odd comic moment but it isn't um and so that we can lean into the uh the the, the problems that this worldview is is setting up um there's an interesting question about performance style as well i've i've been talking about melodrama um but you know what would what performance style is appropriate for us today for something like this where it has those issues is a more Brechtian view uh, or a, a, a routine. Um, so, yeah, thoughts on that from the room uh, in the last five minutes or so. I'll go to Kyle first, then Sarah, then Lynn. The one thing that kind of bothered me when we were doing this is that scene with Charles and the sister, it felt it felt like it was not clear, like it was very, it needed to be untangled in some way, mm. like maybe timing or something like that. And, and then also Charles coming back in and being the kind of moral 
voice was really problematic uh, to me. But so those are the only things that I saw that otherwise I thought I love this. Mm. I mean, the, this thing is that this is a text to really unpack and chew and, mm. and, and do things mm. with. Um, you know, we've had so much discussion and it's been very condensed uh, because of uh, mm. the sort of the way the timing of it all works. Um, but it, it, it's it's leap, giving us all sorts of, you know, issues to ra grapple with. Uh, Sarah, then Lynn, then Bryony. Yes, I don't know that I would call this a tragedy um, because it doesn't leave you with that sense of catharsis mm -hmm. that tragedy mm -hmm. is supposed to leave you with it actually just leaves you with a really icky feeling and and the icky feeling for me partly stems from the same icky feeling that i quite often get with the end of early modern comedies um it, there's there's a sort of harmony in inverted commas imposed upon the characters that um does not sit well with me as a reader slash viewer in 2022 um, and I mean, I, I mean, like, I, I, I feel cheated by the fact that there were not more bodies on the stage in the end, because I really wanted some of those people to die. But um, that aside, I think the only, uh, well, not the only way to do it, but certainly the, the most interesting way to do it from my perspective would be to do what Alexandra was talking about and really lean into that ickiness, uh, and, and, and show it up and make the audience uncomfortable really uncomfortable and quite what genre that is i'm not sure because it's not a comedy but it's not a tragedy either but i think it would be very very interesting to do yeah i think susan comes in at the end uh takes out all the men in in a kill bill style uh montage <laughs> and then she grabs uh, uh mistress anne and makes her eat a pie and then she's fine <laughs> um and you know just you know, uh, it, it's okay. Pie. It's okay. Have a sausage. It 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 would be okay. Um, bit of cake and a cup of tea. Uh, Lynn. Yeah, I mean, I think Rob is right that this is a this is a, a period piece, and 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 the people who have said you you need to lean into the revelation that this this system of values is so toxic. Um, but on the other hand, I think ideally you want your audience to realize we haven't really moved in pa past that entirely. Mm. There's a stoppard play where, and I think it's the real thing, where there's a discussion between a man and his wife's friend and the man is, is having anxiety over whether his wife's had an affair. And the friend is like, the female friend is like, yeah, everything hinges on that, doesn't it? Did she or didn't she? Like that's the only thing that matters is is whether somebody had physical access to her. Doesn't matter whether she loves you anymore, doesn't matter, um, whether she wants to repair the relationship, all that matters is did they do it, and, and you know, and she's and she's criticizing that that sort of reductionist look of early, whether a, a marriage should continue. It's like did the act happen? Uh, so we haven't really entirely moved past some of the values that are that are so deeply woven into this story. It would be great if we could make the audience aware of that mm. um there are ways and means i, I yes I, I like that thought Bryony, then elizabeth and eric my thoughts just disappeared inside. <laughs> it's gone it's gone elizabeth i've got it it'll come to you in a moment um my i was just thinking about what lynn was saying and i was reminded me of this patrick marber play closer um that was made into a film with um Julia Roberts and and Jude Law and and it was it's just interesting because it's all about the the inability to make connections it's about the inability to make connections and you were just talking about relationships and um the the challenge of of placing this in its time when the difficulty in the relationships might actually be quite modern I feel like and of initial being okay with the infidelity is quite modern you know i feel like rather than the early modern concept but then her being being um uh, sort of repentant of it out afterwards becomes much more of an early modern concept so i would just like that on concept of playing with relationships and the idea of it and it did remind me of closer mm. uh, eric and then we'll close with lois I was going to be sneaky and try and mention Game of Chess because I mentioned it in the chat earlier. Um, but cool. it's just because, like, you know, 
Yeah, we've read it, but also it's kind of one of those plays that we've read and sort of gone, well, what do we do with this? Because it's such a, of its time, like all the references are very topical and um, uh, temporally fixed. I don't know if that's the right term, but anyway. Um, whereas um, this one is kind of of its time, but also as Elizabeth just pointed out <laughs> and pretty much everyone else, uh, like if you play this up, it's basically a case of domestic abuse uh, gone to the extreme, which you can probably find in the news if you like look it up. I mean, if you like just look at headlines uh, or something. Um, and yeah, it's such an interesting play to, to sort of examine and workshop and well, like there is that debate of like bringing it into modern or early modern staging or original staging, but I think original staging could actually be interesting. <laughs> um, as you said, I, I, I am a fan of original staging because the costumes, um, yeah. And you know, sorry. Not and... normally, but I'm I'm leaning that way here. Um, but the, uh, other staging uh, uh, options are available. Lois. Uh, yeah. Um, well, first, I just want to say that my the the very first item in the chat, if you download it, is the Stoppard bit that uh, I, I mentioned yesterday, where you've got the card game with everybody being heavily symbolic, and then you've got it all turning into a completely wild card game such as never, ever existed. In case you're curious about it, you can find it there. Um, what I actually wanted to say was that there's something uh, that we haven't really touched on in the play where... Um, characters do just step out of the action and address the audience. We had one example of it, I think, with Jenkin. And uh, uh, there's one where uh, Charles actually says in his scene with Susan just before Sir Francis enters, observe her love to soothe it to my suit, her honor she will hazard, though not lose, to bring me out of debt, her rigorous hand will pierce her heart. I mean, this observe her love can only be talking to the audience. And we've had also with the uh, with Anne in the scene with her husband. She has, uh, well, the scene, in fact, when he leaves her on her own and she sort of soliloquizes and she addresses women, you know, women who might uh, betray their husbands, you know, learn from me, you know. Uh, this is really difficult to deal with. And I think possibly at the end, you might have Frankfurt addressing the audience as well. Um, so that that sense of people being both in and out of the action, you might just want to cut all those bits, but, uh, uh, you know, if you tried to figure out a way of playing it that brought that in. And I don't know whether the music would uh, add to that as well. I mean, sometimes when, when there's music, it has the effect of taking you slightly out of, you know, realistic identification with the characters. Mm. Yeah, I, and I think that might be part of what the text is. I mean, in, in modern poems, we'd call it a bit Brechtian, but, uh, you know, the, the, those asides are, are, may function that way some of them do some of them don't um and yeah i think that's a really really good point a good point to close on because we have run out of time on this particular text so all that remains is to thank all the wonderful readers for their wonderful reading thank you very much everyone and goodbye yeah. the sharpness likes me not <laughs>